right. Well, good morning. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25? We're going to make our way to Zechariah 1. We're going to start in Jeremiah 25. Last week, we did a brief, a very brief introduction to the book of Zechariah. And what we took away from that was this was God's plan to establish his millennial kingdom and his son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, ruling over that millennial kingdom, worldwide rule, this earth for a thousand years. What I want to do this morning is put a timeline in front of us, a timeline in front of us that helps us understand how we get to the point of Zechariah, the beginning of Zechariah. So there's going to be up there a timeline for us. And what we'll see is that beginning in about 605 BC, there was the first deportation of the Jews. There's a series of three deportations of the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom and the southern king were divided, and the northern kingdom had been carried off into exile a number of years before. The southern kingdom remained, and they were just as sinful and even more sinful than the northern kingdom. So God had them be deported to Babylon. We're going to get into the details of that. The first was in 605 BC. There was a second deportation a few years later in 597. And then there was a third one in 586 BC. Nebuchadnezzar was at the center of all of this. He was the king of Babylon, the ruler of Babylon. He came into power. Uh, he died eventually. And there was a decree by Cyrus who followed him. And that decree was to actually rebuild the temple. That was about 538 BC. What happened shortly after that decree was in that same time frame, Jews were allowed to return from Babylon to their homeland, to Judah. And the purpose again for that was to rebuild the temple. And so the temple work began and it began in about 536 BC. It continued for a short period of time and then it stopped and it remained stopped for somewhere between 14 to 16 years, something like that. Let's go and look in our Bibles at Jeremiah chapter 25. We're going to look at verses 8 through 11, and we're going to see how it is that uh, God had a design all along for this to take place. Let me read, starting in verse 8. Therefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts, because you have not listened to my words, behold, I will send Nebuchadnezzar against this land, this whole land, to be a waste place and an object of horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Notice how specific God is. He has a specific location and he has a specific duration. 70 years in Babylon. Now turn to chapter 29. And we're going to see the long-term view of God's design. And we're going to see again a reference to 70 years. Look at verses 10 and 11. Thus says Yahweh, when 70 years have been fulfilled for Babylon... I will visit you and establish my good word to you to return you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for peace and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. What God is doing here is he is not providing inspiring material for a high school graduation speech. He's not doing that. Instead, he has something much bigger in view. He is beginning to unfold his plan to establish the millennial kingdom the millennial kingdom with Messiah Jesus ruling over the world from Jerusalem. And the 12 tribes of Israel gathered on that same land, worshiping him in the land that he promised to them. God is saying, I'm going to send you into exile and I will bring you back with my long-term plan in view. I remember all of the covenants that I have made to your fathers. So what happens? 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar rolls in. Let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. And we're just going to see how this plays out. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. The third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So the last good king in Israel's history and Judah's history is in the rear view. You have a succession of poor kings, evil kings, wicked kings at the end of their, their existence here. Nebuchadnezzar comes and he besieges Jerusalem. That was about 606. The deportation started about a year later. Daniel 1 through 4 is a chapter, is a story of the Babylonian rule. And, and this is one of the greatest periods of global domination by a world superpower that we know of before Greece and Rome. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon were truly a powerful, powerful country. 
All of it came from God. But Nebuchadnezzar only lived about 35 more years. And following him, there was another succession of weak rulers leading to Belshazzar. And Belshazzar was nothing like his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he didn't have the skills. He didn't have the ability. He didn't have the leadership. He was nothing like Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, drop ahead to chapter 5 of Daniel, and we're going to see what happens. Uh, most of us know how this goes. Belshazzar is holding a feast. His empire is crumbling around him. The Medes and the Persians are, are, are moving in. They're encroaching. They've besieged Babylon. And what is he doing? He's gathered his nobles and his his man, and he's drinking wine in the presence of all of these people. And in verse 5 of Daniel 5, suddenly the fingers of a man's hand come out and begin writing on the wall. Drop down to verse 26. God has numbered your kingdom and he has put an end to it. God has said to Babylon, this is enough. You're finished. Verse 27, you personally have been found lacking. In verse 28, your kingdom has been given over to the Medes and the Persians. So that's the end of Babylon. Verse 30, that same night Belshazzar was killed, Darius the Mede received the kingdom. Something that's important for us to remember in all of this is that this takes place while this is all happening in Babylon. The Jews are right there in Babylon. They're still in exile while all of this is happening. This plan has been God's plan all along. We're going to take one more journey. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 44 and see that God had all of this in plan all along. This is about 690 BC. So this is 150 years before any of these things are coming to pass. Isaiah chapter 44, look at verse 28. And again, we want to see that God is the one who controls all of human history. He is the one who is doing this. God says in verse 28 of Isaiah 44, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. All my good pleasure, he will complete. And saying of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. So God foretells of this exile 150 years before it happens. And he identifies by name the man that will bring this about. And it's critical to our understanding here that God's purpose was not simply just to return the Jews to the land. But look at the focus he puts on the temple restoration. Jude, uh, Jerusalem herself will be built and the temple, your foundation, will be laid. So the, the temple itself was destroyed, the original temple, Solomon's temple, the beautiful temple, the temple that God designed that was perfect for his people to come and worship him and represent him to all of the nations and show all of the nations what it looked like to live in a right relationship with God. Uh, that temple was gone, but God has a plan for another temple. Let me just read from Ezra chapter one here and show us uh, part of this plan. Ezra chapter one, we're going to see how Cyrus actually does this. Uh, verse 1 of Ezra 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to complete the word of Yahweh from the mouth of Jeremiah, we're getting a picture of the continuity that's going on here. Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Verse 2, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all of his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of Yahweh. So Cyrus here is a Gentile, but notice what he knows and understands. He knows Yahweh's name. He is a Gentile, knows Yahweh's name. He is the God who is. He knows that Yahweh is the God of heaven, and he knows that the task is to rebuild the temple. This was prophesied again in Isaiah 44, 150 years earlier. Ezra chapter 2 goes ahead and gives us a detail of what takes place after this decree. These are the people of the province who came out of captivity of the exiles. They came with Zerubbabel and Jehua, Jeshua, which is Joshua and Nehemiah, the whole assembly together if at the end of this list of people sums to 42,360 people. So there's 42,000 Jews that returned from exile in Babylon to Judah. Ezra chapter three, verse eight. Now, in the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel began the work, and then he appointed Levites from 20 years and older to direct the work of the house of Yahweh. So this is an organization. There is structure. There is a plan. There's a framework for how they're going to do this. And then a little later, we see the joy in the people of Israel, the people of Judah, as they do this. Let me read from Ezra chapter 3, verse 11. And this is in reference to the people. 
They sang, praising and giving thanks to Yahweh, saying, For he is good, his loving kindness endures forever and ever. And all the people shouted because the foundation was laid. So the foundation of this temple was laid. And this is genuine joy from the people. They are a weak and powerless people. They've been living away from their own land for 70 years, but they're back. And they're rejoicing at what looks like the unfolding of God's plan for them. They're pretty excited about this, but there are challenges that lay ahead. And we see those in Ezra chapter four. Ezra chapter four, verse one, then the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to Yahweh. So there are adversaries. These are people who already lived there before the Jews returned from exile. In Ezra chapter four, verse eight, these adversaries, they write a very compelling letter to King Artaxerxes. And in verse 17, Artaxerxes issues a decree against Judah. And then in verse 24 of Ezra 4, we see the culmination of what happens at the end of our timeline here. Then the work of the house of God in Jerusalem stopped, and it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. This is a, a different Darius from the one who actually received the kingdom of Babylon when it was conquered during the reign of Belshazzar. He's a much more powerful Darius, and his reign began in 522 B.C., so this takes place in 520 BC. The foundation was there, but nothing else. And uh, this is a foundation that is central to our understanding as we get to chapter one of Zechariah. They built the foundation, but that's all that they have. So there's no progress on the building of the temple from somewhere around 536 or 535, somewhere like that, until 520. About 16 years, there's no progress. And you can imagine what happens to a people uh, in the hearts and the minds of these Jews. They were so excited. It looks like God was beginning to unfold his plan for us. It looks like we're going to be doing what we're supposed to be doing as a people. You can imagine what happens when they stop building the house and that God has chosen to dwell among them and they stop building the actual structure that it is that God is going to use to dwell among them. What's inevitably going to happen is what actually did happen. That is that they drifted away. And that's what you see at the beginning of Zechariah. As we look at chapter one, remember God's plan and his promise for them. God says back in Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you. These are plans that include welfare. These are plans that include a future and a hope. I know my plans for you. I will be faithful to them. But these plans don't come without a requirement from God on the people of Judah. So just as the foundation is essential to the construction of a temple, so also Israel's repentance is essential to receiving God's blessing to them. Repentance is a significant issue here. And by the way, God is talking about a nationwide repentance here. He's talking about a, a wholesale turning of all of the people, not just a few people here and there in Zechariah's day, not just a few people here and there like we have today, but a wholesale turning of the nation of Israel to him. So that's what we need to keep in mind when we, we begin reading chapter one of Zechariah. So let's go to chapter one of Zechariah, finally. We'll get there, we'll go to chapter one. Um, let's get a feel for the structure of the book as we do this. And let's get an idea for how the message of Zechariah comes to us. And the book is pretty well arranged. There's not a lot of, of differing opinion on how this book is laid out. Uh, you have one foundation at the beginning of this book. That's in verses one through six. The idea here is that repentance is the foundation of God's blessing to his people. It's a requirement on God's people, if God is going to bless them, is that there must be repentance in view. That's a very short beginning of the book. The rest of chapter 1 through the end of chapter 6 is a series of eight visions. And we'll talk a little bit about them in just a minute. But then in chapters 7 and 8, God has a series of four discourses, four dialogues. And then in chapters 9 through 14, God releases two burdens for the people. Let's think about the idea of a vision here. I want to direct your attention and just remind you of what the author of Hebrews says when he starts out his letter to his audience. He says this in chapter 1, verse 1, God having spoken long ago, so Old Testament, to the fathers, Old Testament, in, many, in the prophets, in many portions, and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in Son. So he says, God has spoken to our ancestors in many portions and in many ways. And one of those ways that he spoke to his people was through visions. And this was not some mysterious communication. Rather, it, what it was, was God was clearly placing a scene in view of the person who was seeing it. And that scene was information and contained a message for the people of Israel. 
And this was not uncommon for God to speak to Israel. You'll see visions located all throughout your Old Testament. And I'm just going to give you three of them. Help us understand just how familiar the people of Israel were with visions. This wasn't an uncommon thing. We're all familiar with the Abrahamic covenant where, where God gives promises to Abraham. He says, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to give you land. You're going to be a blessing to all the nations. You'll be a father of many. Look at how Genesis 15, 1 begins when, when God is beginning to unfold some of this plan for Abraham. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. So the Abrahamic covenant, we have that, that came in a vision, a vision to Abraham. Not just the Abrahamic covenant, but the Davidic covenant also came in a vision. Remember the story from 2 Samuel chapter 7, David says to Nathan, I want to build a house for the Lord. He should not reside in this tent. Let's build a house for the Lord. And, and Nathan says, that's a really good idea. Let's do that. Uh, and then what happens is the Lord speaks to Nathan. And the Lord tells him, no, actually, David's son, Solomon, will build the temple. And uh, then what happens is the Lord gives Nathan the Davidic covenant. And let's see what 2 Samuel 7:17 7, says about how all those words came to Nathan. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. According to this vision. So you have two of the greatest covenants in the Old Testament were communicated in visions. Then you have the longest book in your Old Testament. You have Isaiah, other than Psalms, 66 chapters of material. And look at how it begins. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. So the prophecy of Isaiah, while it does contain some narrative sprinkled in there, is a series of visions to Isaiah. So what we see in this is that visions are a normal part of God's revelation to Israel in the Old Testament. And the purpose of these visions is to lay out God's plan. And God uses visions to communicate with Zechariah. He uses Adamum. He's going to lay out his plan for his establishment of the millennial kingdom, starting with Jesus' reign from Jerusalem. So we have eight visions. And then we have four discourses in chapters 7 and 8. And the focus of these is really on two things. On, on the first focus is Israel's insincerity, the way they demonstrate their insincerity in their religious practice and in their private life. And then the, the focus shifts from that to the millennial kingdom. And um, the focus there is on God's promise of the millennial kingdom, that it actually is coming. And then uh, he talks about the requirements on Israel for that uh, millennial kingdom to come. And then the two burdens at the end from chapters 9 through 14 focus on the person of Christ. The first three chapters relate to Christ's earthly ministry. They surround Christ's earthly ministry, his coming, what he does, his rejection by his own people. And then the last three chapters, of course, uh, center around and focus on everything leading up to and accomplishing Jesus' millennial reign on the earth. So that's the book. You've got a foundation at the beginning, and then you've got eight visions, and then you've got four burdens, uh, four discourses, followed by two burdens. So uh, how does the book start? Um, with this grand view, we, we can't lose sight of, of the most important thing. We're thinking here, okay, God is laying out this, this massive plan, this wonderful plan, this plan that is going to be a success. Uh, it's easy to get excited about the plan, but we can't forget the most important thing. And, and Zechariah puts that right at the front of his book. And that is the essential nature of godly living today. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the foundation of blessing in chapter one, and it has everything to do about repentance. So let's read together uh, verses one through three. Uh, the opening chapter of Zechariah. And as I read, just take note of the time frame here, and it's relative to the reign of Darius. We're going to be referring to other time frames relative to Darius in the coming sections of the book. In the eighth month of the, section of, uh, the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, Yahweh was very wrathful against your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus says Yahweh of hosts, return to me declares Yahweh of hosts. Return to me that I may return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. So the focus here in the time frame is in the second year, the eighth month of Darius. And the individual here who's coming is Zechariah the prophet. He's the one who receives this. You see that he's the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo. No mention is made of Berechiah elsewhere. 
Uh, other references to Zechariah show him in reference to Iddo. It, it probably indicates that Berechiah was Zechariah's father, but he probably died at some point along the way. This message is about God's disposition towards um, the fathers of Israel. What we see here is that God has a disposition in verse 2. Yahweh was very wrathful against your fathers. So Zechariah starts his, his discourse with the people of Israel with a description of God's disposition towards their fathers, towards the people who were the, the ones who lived before and during the exile. Verse 3, this is the instruction. Therefore say to them, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, return to me, declares Yahweh of hosts, that I may return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. What is God's message? What is the active verb here? It's return, return to me. You've returned to your land, but you haven't returned to me. So to return to me is to turn from your current way of life and to acknowledge me as Yahweh. And the way that you demonstrate that is through obedience to me and worship of me. That is what has not been happening. We know from Deuteronomy chapter 6, what does God command of Israel? You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, all your strength. Love, love God. In the middle of Deuteronomy chapter 6, God talks about how Israel is supposed to have his instructions on their forehead and on their wrists and everywhere else. It's supposed to be in front of them in everything they do. When they get up and they rise and they, they lay down at night, they're supposed to talk about it with their kids. So they're to love God and they're to obey God. After that, God says in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you shall not follow other gods. So God says, you're to love me and you're to obey me. You are to worship me. So when God is saying, return to me, return to the things that I told you at the beginning. Love me, obey me, worship me only. That is not what they've been doing. And God says at the end of verse 3, do this that I may return to you. He doesn't just say, worship me and leave it at that. He tells him, I will return to you, but my return to you is contingent on your turning to me. Notice the, the kindness of God in this. God is saying your repentance is essential for a restored relationship with me. And it's only in the context of that restored relationship with me that you'll be able to experience the reality of my plan for you as a people in this millennial kingdom, in this place. You must return to me first. And then notice one other thing in verse 3. Notice the repetition of Yahweh of hosts. He doesn't just say Yahweh. He says Yahweh of hosts three times. He wants to make sure that Zechariah gets this. And then indirectly, he wants to make sure that it, the nation of Judah, that they get this as well. We know Yahweh. We know what that means. That's the eternally existent I am. I am the God who has no beginning. I have no end. I exist outside of time. I exist outside of space. I am the ultimate authority in all things. But he isn't just Yahweh, he's Yahweh of hosts. And the word for hosts here, the Hebrew word, relates to a warrior in battle. God is saying, I exist outside of time and space, I control everything, and I am a warrior. I possess all authority, I possess all power. There is none who can give you the assurance of the future that I can give you, because I am Yahweh. So return to me. Don't return to anything else, return to me. So verse 3 is what they must do. Verse 4 is what they must not do. They must not do what their fathers did. He says, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets called out saying, thus says Yahweh of hosts, return now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But what did they do? They did not listen and they did not give heed. So the former prophets spoke to pre-exiled Judah. And they said, return from your evil ways, return from your evil deeds. That went on for not generations, but that went on for centuries and centuries. Evil ways relates to a course of life. Zechariah is telling the people of Judah, your fathers, they were content to live apart from me. They were content to live indifferent to me. They were content to be ignorant of me. That's the way your fathers were. But not only that, they, they didn't just have evil ways. They had evil deeds. This is something that we need to grasp as well. In addition to just being a, a generally indifferent people to me, there were specific sins that they loved to do that I forbade. First and foremost among all of those is you will have no other gods before me. And they were worshiping everything that moved. So this helps us see what offends God. In general, it's a life that doesn't esteem him, that doesn't recognize him. 
but also in specifics, it's a life that loves sin more than loves pursuing him and obeying him and loving him. And so there's a relevance for us there, and we'll get there in a second. But what Zechariah is helping Judah see, and he's helping us understand this as well, is that there is a characteristic of a sinful disposition towards God. And it's that you see it at the end of verse four. It's the people don't listen and they don't give heed. And to listen there is to hear with the intention of obeying. It's not just to hear the words, but it's to hear with the intention of actually submitting yourself to those words. And to give heed is to accept as true. Slightly different than listening, it's to accept as truth and then to respond to it. The fathers, they they had no intention of obeying and they didn't even accept God's word as a heart level as being true. They lived completely ignorant of it. So God's saying, this is what true repentance is. Turn from your indifference to me. Don't be indifferent to me any longer and turn from the things that I have told you are offensive to me. Don't live that way anymore. Hear my instructions with the intent to obey them and know that what I say is true because I am the warrior God who will defeat the nations that are around you, all of your foes in this land. And these just aren't aren't platitudes. If you look at verse five, you can see that God is not just stating something that sounds really great. He is saying something that has true teeth in it. He says, look at your fathers in verse five. Where are they? And what God is doing here is he is bringing into focus the consequence of their father's sins. Where did most of the fathers die? They died in exile very nearly all of them. And they had no opportunity to experience God's plan for their restoration because they died in Babylon. Have you ever wondered why the exile was for 70 years? Why did God pick 70 years? Why didn't he pick seven years? That's a nice number. Or maybe 12 years. That sounds good. Those are popular numbers in our Old Testament. Well, God picked 70 years as a testimony to the next generation of the consequence, the permanent consequence of idolatry and hardness of heart towards God. Those 70 years were there so that those those exiles could see that those who were the cause of the exile were going to die in exile. That's pretty sobering. And God finishes this in verse six by saying, did not my words and my statutes overtake your fathers? Sinful indifference will lull you into thinking, I don't really care if if I offend God. I don't really care. I don't really care because the consequences are probably small enough that I don't really even need to think about them. I don't need to do that. I don't need to be worried. But God is saying, no, that's a broken mindset. God is saying emphatically, no. Those people and their rebellion against me did not stand the test of time. It didn't stand the test of time. They, They died in exile. My word has come to pass. And it has overtaken them. It has subdued them. So what does that mean for us? We look at the first six verses of Zechariah and we say, okay, this is really good. But let's turn that and see if that makes sense for us. We're Gentiles. We live in the 20th century. There's no Babylon. There's no Cyrus. There's no Darius. We don't have land promises the way that the Jews do. What we need to remember is that God's character is unchanging. So if you live indifferently to God, if you live in rebellion against God, If you live ignorant of God and aren't bothered by that, remember that you cannot outlive God's word. Repentance from self-rule is the foundation for an eternal relationship with God. That's the place that is the only experience in which you experience true blessing is an eternal relationship with God. And that true blessing is fellowship with him. All of this only comes when a person repents from their own self-rule. That's exactly what the people in the Old Testament were doing. That's exactly what the people of Judah were doing. And God is saying to them, turn from your self-rule. That same principle still applies today. So that's our takeaway today. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the first two visions that Zechariah has in chapter 1 through the end of chapter 1, verse 21. Uh, But what I want us to remember in the takeaway here is that the most important thing here is that repentance from self-rule is the gate to all of these things. All right, so let's begin to talk about these visions. There are eight of them. There are eight of them, and they divide pretty neatly. There's this idea of a a chiasm in Hebrew literature. And what it is, is is a structure where it's an ascending structure, and um, the sides uh, tend to gather in, and they, they, they meet at a climax in the middle. And what God has is he has four pairs of visions for, for Zechariah here. 
Um, visions number one and eight go together. Visions number two and seven go together. Three and five, uh, three and six go together and four and five go together. Vision one is about horses. And God is saying, I have not forgotten my promises. Vision eight is about four chariots. It's God's plan to fulfill those promises. Vision two is about four horns. It's God's general plan for the nations outside of Judah. Vision seven is about a woman in a basket, and it's God's plan to judge the nations. Vision three is about a man with a measuring rod, and this is God's promise to restore his people. Vision six is a flying scroll, and it's God's judgment of his people. Visions four and five deal with uh, visions four is Joshua representing the Messiah interceding for his people. And, and vision five is a lampstand uh, representing the Messiah revealing God's glory to the nations. So it culminates in the middle visions four and five with Messiah Christ at the middle of it all. And it's very, very likely. And we'll see this throughout the summer that the Zechariah saw all of these in one night. So let's start in verse seven and see what happens as we look at the first vision. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, then we get into it. So this is our, our first vision. The timeline here as we look at this is the second year, and it's the 11th month, and it's the 24th day of the rule of Darius. And Darius is the frame of reference here. He's the point of reference. Second year, 11th month, 24th day. Now, Haggai and Zechariah were contemporary to one another. Haggai was the older prophet. Zechariah was the younger prophet. Haggai's message was one of exhortation. You people need to rebuild this temple. Zechariah's message complemented Haggai's message, and his message was one of comfort. God will be with you as you do this. Turn back a couple of pages to Haggai chapter 1, and let's read verses 14 and 15. And at the end of verses 15, take a look at the time frame that's referenced there. Again, the reference is the rule of Darius. Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work on the house of Yahweh. When was it? Verse 15, 24th day of the sixth month of the second year of Darius. So they came and did work starting on uh, the 24th day of the sixth month. What we have here. Back in Zechariah chapter 1 is the 24th day of the 11th month. So the people have been working under Haggai's direction first, the sixth month. If we go back to chapter 1, verse 1, the message came to Zechariah in the second year. That's the same year in the eighth month. So it's two or three months after the initial call from Haggai. And it's five months after the work started. So the people have had three months to consider their relationship with God. They've had three months to consider what Zechariah first said to them in verse one. They've had three months to consider the idea of their obedience and their participation in God's blessing. And it's after those three months that this first vision comes. And remember, there were adversaries in the land. And so the people definitely needed encouragement. They needed perseverance, but there was also some indifference on the part of the people. And Haggai addresses some of that indifference, not so much in Zechariah, but in Haggai. But everybody knew that the temple that they were designing and they were building was nothing like Solomon's temple. Everybody knew that Solomon's temple was this wonderful structure. Everybody came and marveled at all of it. They marveled at its size, its dimensions, its symmetry. They marveled at all of the gold and the stone and the bronze and everything else. It was perfect. And they knew that this was nothing like the original and they were wondering, is this all worth it? Should I put myself at risk among these adversaries to do this hard work that they don't want me to do? They needed to be comforted by the truth that God will accomplish his plans. And central to this is his people worshiping him. There's no benefit. There's no long-term plan that doesn't include the people of Israel, the people of Judah worshiping God. They need to be a participant in God's plan according to not how they see it, but according to how God has said, according to God's design. God is saying, I will restore you for the purpose of worshiping me. And as always, you worship me the way I have prescribed you worship me. 
You don't worship me the way you think and the way you deem is right. And the way that I prescribe is that it involves my presence in a house that you build for me. So you need to build this temple. And you need encouragement to that end. And Zechariah's visions is what is going to provide them with that encouragement. So let's see. Let's look at the first part of the vision itself. We get into the details. We're going to read verses 8 through 11, starting just with verse 8. And we are going to see that Messiah is ready. So verse 8, I saw at night. So this is again as a vision. And Zechariah says, I saw. I saw at night and behold, a man was riding on a red horse and he was standing among the myrtle trees, which were in the ravine with red sorrel and white horses behind him. So Isaiah, or sorry, Zechariah again sees. This is nothing unusual. This is not unlike other Old Testament visions. It's divine revelation. And first let's notice the man in, in verse eight. A man riding on a red horse, he was standing in myrtle trees. Zechariah describes him only as a man right here. He doesn't give other details about the man. He gives details surrounding him and his horse and the trees. But if you notice, he's riding on a red horse, and that suggests a readiness for war and battle. Horses were, were very essential in battle. Peek ahead to verse 11, and we're going to see a little bit more about this man. Notice in verse 8 that he's standing among the myrtle trees. A question is asked of those who are behind him. We get to verse 11. They answer the angel Yahweh who was standing among the myrtle trees. If you put verse 8 and verse 11 together, what that tells you is that the man who is standing on the myrtle trees and the angel of Yahweh who is standing among the myrtle trees, they are one and the same. The one standing among the myrtle trees is the angel of Yahweh. And time and time again, we, we see in the Old Testament, and we won't go through it, but you see that the angel of Yahweh very often is Yahweh himself. And what we want to notice, secondly, is that there's a red horse. The man, the angel of the Lord, is riding on a red horse. Uh, jump ahead to chapter 9. We're going to take a look at verse 10. And we're going to see what horses mean. I mentioned a little bit about a context of war and battle. This is a different context. This is future prophecy about a coming time of peace. Again, this is centering around uh, the reign of Christ, the coming of Christ. This is in the series of those two burdens. Chapter 9, verse 10. God is saying what he's going to do in the future. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the bow of war will be cut off. And he will speak peace to the nations. Look at what accomplishes that peace. What accomplishes the peace is the cutting off of chariots and horses and bows of war. What this underscores is that the horse is used to indicate um, an activity and a readiness for war. So this man who is riding on a red horse is ready for war. He's ready for activity. And then third, notice the location where he's standing. This is important as well. He was standing among the myrtle trees in which were in the ravine. Old Testament Jerusalem. Uh, there was a, rav a ravine on the east side of the city. If you've been to Jerusalem, you can still see there is a ravine on the east side of the city. Most commentators say that it's pretty well known that a myrtle grove, a grove of myrtle trees was growing in that ravine throughout much of Israel's Old Testament history. And this was familiar to Jews. Most Jews knew this. And myrtle trees are foretelling a vision. They're foretelling something about the millennial kingdom. And to do that, we need to turn to Isaiah 55 to see what happens. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 55, and we'll see how myrtle trees relate to the millennial kingdom. Again, this is future prophecy that Isaiah is speaking. And he says, instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. And instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up and it will be to Yahweh for his renown for an everlasting sign, which will not be cut off. There is an everlasting sign. These trees, which include myrtle trees, are an everlasting sign, which will not be cut off. So it's not a, a reference to this time frame. It's not a reference to this age. It's a reference to another age that is coming. One more Old Testament reference for us to help us understand these, these myrtle trees. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. And we're going to see here is where these myrtle trees started. And it has to do with the Feast of Booths. The Feast of Booths was an occasion in which Israel would gather together and they would celebrate God's bounty to them. They would celebrate all that God did to bless them in their land. And so God says, 
You're not going to celebrate this in your own way. You're going to do it the way I tell you to do this. Verse 39 of Leviticus 23. On exactly the 15th day, on the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, so you've just brought in this nice harvest, you shall celebrate the feast of Yahweh for seven days, with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. Verse 40. On the first day, you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches, and boughs of leafy trees, and you shall be glad before Yahweh your God for seven days. These myrtle trees had a very pleasant aroma. But what God has here is beautiful trees that the Jews would gather, and they would make temporary structures for themselves. They would reside in those structures during the time that they would be worshiping God and celebrating God for his bounty and his provision to them. So Old Testament is here celebrating God's provision for them. God is saying millennial kingdom Israel will do the same thing. They will gather together with me in these myrtle trees, these myrtle boughs, and they will worship me for my provision to them in the millennial kingdom. The last thing we want to notice about our, our vision that Zechariah sees are the horses. And that's at the end of verse eight. He was standing with red sorrel and white horses behind him. It's interesting that Zechariah doesn't just say he's standing with horses behind him. He identifies colors, red and white and sorrel is either brown or a mixture of, of red and white. White, we know, represents a righteousness and a holiness. Often in the Old Testament, red is a sign of bloodshed and avenging of wrath. And likely there were men on these horses. And again, this is speaking of a readiness for war. God has a plan here. He's saying, Listen, I, I am going to accomplish the, the taking of the millennial kingdom. And it's not going to be a sweet, pleasant taking. It's going to involve bloodshed. But righteousness will prevail in that. Revelation 19 describes the same events that Zechariah 14 describes. Revelation 19 is the, the New Testament perspective. Of course, Zechariah is the Old Testament perspective. Listen to these words from Revelation 19. This is Jesus. He's bursting forth from from heaven, and he's coming down to take his millennial kingdom. And this is what is describing who is attending to Jesus as he descends to earth to take the millennial kingdom. Revelation 19, 14. The armies which are in heaven clothed in white linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. They're following behind him. And again, in our vision, uh, the man is in front, and what is behind him are men on horses. So the takeaway here is that Messiah Christ is poised for war. Judah may have thought that God had abandoned them for the last 16 years. This temple, all we have is the foundation. It's just sitting there. Um, but the reality is, is that Christ is actually poised. He is ready to establish his millennial kingdom. So this is all about Christ's readiness to do what he has said he will do. But also we're going to see in verses 9 through 11, not only is Christ ready, but he is actually very cognizant, very aware of what is taking place. So Zechariah asks, my Lord, what are these? And the angel who was speaking with me said, I will show you what these are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are those whom Yahweh has sent to patrol the earth. So they answered the angel of Yahweh who was standing among the myrtle trees. And they said, we have patrolled the earth. And behold, all the earth is sitting still and quiet. Zechariah knows this is a divine revelation. He understands that. Uh, because in, in verse 8, you see the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah. So he knows this, but he doesn't know the meaning. So he asks in verse 9, he says, my Lord. And he speaks to the angel who was speaking with him. This is the angel who is speaking with him. This is not the angel of Yahweh who's in the vision. There's an angel who is with Zechariah. He's attending to him. Zechariah sees a vision, but he's speaking with an angel. So he says in verse 9, what are these? He's asking about the horses, the red ones, the white ones. Zechariah has no way of knowing the meaning of what this is. He's just the priest who's seeing it. The angel is there to explain the meaning to Zechariah. But notice who answers the question. Zechariah asks the angel who is with him. If you look at verse 10 at the beginning of the verse, you see that somebody else answers. The man who is standing among the myrtle trees answered. The angel of Yahweh is the one who's answering. He's answering from among the myrtle trees, again, pointing to a future celebration. Something very, very similar to the Festival of Booths. 
And in verse 10, he says, I will show you what these are. The angel of the Lord is eager to declare what is in store for Israel. This is so good for us to see. Uh, There's an eagerness. There's a willingness. There's a readiness on a part of the angel to explain what is coming. In verse 10, at the end of the verse, you see, these are those whom Yahweh has sent to patrol the earth. And the word patrol in the Old Testament in one sense means just to walk about. But here, the Hebrew is talking about a going about the earth to do God's will. They're going about the world to see and observe and accomplish God's purpose. That's what's in view. So the answer of the angel of Yahweh in verse 11, the report is to the angel of Yahweh because they know he is the one who will take action. If you see this and what do they find in verse 11? They find that all the earth is still and quiet. And this isn't speaking of a a good peace or a true peace or a pleasant peace. Really what this is saying is that there is no sign of battle. There is no sign of the activity that will inaugurate the millennial kingdom. But the angel of Yahweh knows that. So the Messiah is aware of the situation that nothing that will bring about the end of uh, this age and the beginning of the next age has begun to happen yet. So the Messiah is aware of what is taking place. Uh, He is there, he is ready, and he is aware. What we're going to see next at the end of this vision is a unity that takes place, and that's taking place in verses 12 through 17. There is a unity here between different members of the Godhead. And there's a fair amount of dialogue that goes back and forth, and, and so it's going to be helpful for us to read the whole thing straight through. This will help us understand who is speaking, who is listening, who is asking and all of these things. So let's read verses 12 through 17 in one pass. <clears throat> then the angel of Yahweh answered and said, O oh, Yahweh of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah with which you have been indignant these 70 years? Yahweh answered the angel who was speaking with me with good words, comforting words. So the angel who was speaking with me said to me, call out saying, thus says Yahweh of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, but I am very wrathful with the nations who are at ease. For I was only a little wrathful, but they helped increase the calamity. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, declares Yahweh of hosts. And a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. Again, call out saying, thus says Yahweh of hosts, my cities will again overflow with good and Yahweh will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. What we're going to see here is in verse 12, you have the appeal of the Messiah to the father on behalf of his chosen people. How do we know that the appeal is to the father? Well, we see that in verse 12. How long will you have no compassion on Jerusalem with which you have been indignant for these 70 years? Which member of the Godhead was indignant for those 70 years? Which, which member of the Godhead was the offense against when they disobeyed his law? It was against the father. Messiah is asking because the time of his discipline of Judah was now over. The 70 years is over. We see that at the beginning of this passage. You've been indignant these 70 years. That time period is over. But notice that the answer comes immediately. And notice who he answers to. He answers to the angel who is talking with Zechariah. And the reason why he answers to the angel who's speaking with Zechariah is so that that angel can then relate that to Zechariah. And the words are good words and they're comforting words. The the outward appearance is that God is not doing anything, that everything is all the same. It's been 16 years of inactivity. Nothing's taking place. But God's word itself is what brings comfort. And the message is, I am faithful. Look at verse 14. I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. This is the father. He is exceedingly jealous. And we think of jealousy in negative terms. We think of jealousy as something we shouldn't have. But there is a very positive aspect to jealousy. And there is a right place for jealousy. Jealousy that is right and good in God's sight is a strong desire for that which rightly belongs to you. It is right for a wife to be jealous for her husband. It is right for a husband to be jealous for his wife because that one individual rightly belongs to the other one. 
God is exceedingly jealous because nothing could more rightly belong to anyone than Israel belonging to God. God is the one who called Abraham to himself. He is the one who said, I will make you a great nation. Abraham didn't become a great nation on his own at age 99. God was the one who made that. God is exceedingly jealous. And look at the source of that jealousy, the reason or the occasion for that in verse 15. I am very wrathful with the nations who are at ease, for I was only a little wrathful. But look what they did. The nations helped increase the calamity. God had a design for the nations. The nations were God's instrument. They were the nations were God's instrument of wrath to the people of Israel, specifically in two exiles, the exile of the northern kingdom, the exile of the southern kingdom. But there were other times which God brought the nations against Israel that occurred in the period of the judges. It occurred in the period of the kings and the prophets. It covered all the time. It occurred all the time. But here's what God says. Uh, They helped increase the calamity. What God is saying here is they went far beyond what I had intended for them. I had a task for them. I was going to use them as my instrument, but they went way beyond what I gave them to do. And look at God's response in verse 16. Therefore, says Yahweh, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. God hasn't forgotten this. He has compassion in store for these people. My house will be built in it and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. And so God is saying, I will return. I will return to Judah. And the reason why, again, that he will return to them is because there are some within Judah who will return to him. And so God will return to Judah because he will cause some of them to return to him. And he will return specifically to Jerusalem. That's where the temple will be. That's where the temple was that God was before the exile. That's where God resided. That was his place of residence in Israel. That's where his presence was. And he will return with compassion. Notice that he is saying, the father is saying, I will have compassion. And that is what was asked of him in the beginning of this passage about compassion. But he also is going to return with a measuring rod. As you see the measuring rod there, the decimated city, the destroyed city, the the city that's in shambles, that doesn't have a temple, it will be rebuilt. And it will be nothing like what Zerubbabel was beginning to rebuild. There is a time coming when the city will be marvelous and would be wonderful. Verse 17 is more assurance. Again, call out saying, thus says Yahweh of hosts, my cities will again overflow with good. That's a stark contrast to what they had at the present time, what they were looking at. There was no good. They were barely eking out an existence among all of those adversaries. So God will cause the cities to overflow with good and Yahweh will comfort Zion and he will choose Jerusalem. And so God is saying, not only will I rebuild Jerusalem, but it will be rebuilt and it will have an abundant provision. The provision will be beyond what they can imagine. It will be lavish. It will be abundant. And that is a testimony to the rest of the world that God is with them. And we'll see this as we get later into the story here of Zechariah, that that the rest of the nations know that God is with Israel. But Yahweh's going to comfort them. He sees their distress and the avenging of his wrath on the nations will bring comfort to the people of Israel. Yahweh will again choose them. Israel was God's chosen people, but their sin had made it impossible for the world to see that. The world had a hard time seeing that this is God's chosen people and and they're, they're not doing a very good job at all of putting God's character on display. It will once again be apparent to all of the world that the people of Israel belong to Yahweh. So the summary in this first vision is that Messiah Jesus is poised and he is ready to take action. He is ready to take his kingdom. He's very well aware. He's very well appraised of what is taking place in the world. And the father will bring comfort to his people with abundant provision in the new Jerusalem. There's an application for us. And that is that God's faithfulness is unchanging. It's not only unchanging for the Jew, but it's unchanging for the Gentile as well. The Gentile who is in Christ today, regardless of your circumstances, you can rely on God to keep his word regarding his promises. Jacob mentioned that in our communion message. Chris mentioned that in the equipping hour this morning at nine o'clock. I'm going to read from Romans eight, verse 18. 
Paul writes to the church in Rome, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. If this is God's wonderful plan for his people, then what is the plan for those nations who are oppressing his people? And that is the subject of the second vision. God has said, there is comfort coming. We can know there is comfort for the Jew and the Gentile because God's character is the same. And God will actually get, lay out his plan in the second vision for how he's going to deal with nations. So let's go to that. Let's look at verses 18 through 21. And notice as you begin this, as you look at this vision, that this vision begins with the word then. All of the visions begin with the word then. If you look at the beginning of chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, the same Hebrew word begins all of them. In English, it's then. Two things. One that, that shows us that there's continuity. One vision follows after the one that came before it. But we also know that Zechariah is very, very weary of these by the end. These are heavy visions. There's a lot going on here. And by the end of this, we'll see that Zechariah becomes, becomes very, very weary. And again, it, it suggests that Zechariah saw all of these in the same night. I saw this, then I saw this, then I saw this. But before we look into this vision, it's important to, to understand that, that the surrounding nations, even though God was using them as an instrument in the lives of his people, Judah, they hated God. It was not the case that there were some within those nations who worshipped him. There were none who worshipped him. They all hated God. And this is all about God's dealings with the nations that hate him. So let's read verses 18 and 19. So Zechariah says, Then I lifted up my eyes and I saw, and behold, there were four horns. So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these? And he said to me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So what we're going to see here first is, is the description of these oppressors. And so the main thing here that we want to point our attention to at the end of verse 18 are the horns. Zechariah sees four horns. And a sign, uh, a horn is a sign of authority and strength. I want us to just see what God says about horns in the Old Testament. And we can see that a horn is always a sign of power and strength. Psalm 18, 2, Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. In 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 50, David is... Uh, Saul has passed away. David is ascending to the throne. And there is a bit of contention as to whether or not David is going to be the king or one of Saul's descendants, Adonijah, is going to be king. And it becomes apparent that David is prevailing. In 1 Kings chapter 150, verse 50, this is what Adonijah does when he realizes that David is gaining the upper hand. David is prevailing. I'm sorry. I got this wrong. David has passed away and Solomon is coming. We have Adonijah and we have Solomon. You know how it is when you get on a roll with something and you're going and you think, oh, I'm on this. I don't need to look down at my notes. I need to look down at my notes. <laughs> so that's the first one. Um, okay, so what has happened here is David. David has passed away. He's had 40 years of reign. This is really good. And he has passed away. And there's some question as to who comes next. Is it going to be Adonijah? Or is it going to be Solomon? We know the story. Bathsheba comes into Solomon. She speaks with, uh, with him. Adonijah sees that Solomon is prevailing. That's what happens. Solomon is prevailing. And so he arose. This is Adonijah. He arose and he took hold of the horns of the altar. So this is what takes place. Adonijah is grabbing the horns of the altar. He's looking for strength. He's looking for guidance. He is very fearful of Solomon. So it's a sign of authority, it's a sign of strength, but also a horn is an offensive weapon. And what God is doing here is he refers to these nations as horns, as he is referring to the, the harm that they inflicted on Israel. Daniel chapter 7, he refers to four different horns in his, his messages. In chapter 7, he talks about a lion and a bear and a leopard and a fearsome, terrifying creature and these were all characterized as horns. And we know that those mean four nations of Babylon, the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans. 
Israel was oppressed by four worldwide superpowers, primarily Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. And it's very likely that these four horns represent the Gentile nations. And Zechariah really doesn't have any idea what they are. So the, the angel who is still with him answers. In verse 19, the angel who was speaking with said, what are these? He asks them. And the angel says to him, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. He sees this vision in 520 BC, and, and so far only Babylon and the Medo-Persians have oppressed him to this point. But the vision takes place in a point in history that, that looks back on all four of these things. And God is saying, I know there are nations that have offended you. And what they've done is they've scattered you. And it's the dispersing of God's people. And again, it's because of their sin. And they're God's chosen instruments to do this, but they're hateful towards God. So what we're going to see here is God's plan. And we see that in verses 21 and 22. And we'll close with this. Yahweh showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these going to do? And he said, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man lifts up his head. But these craftsmen have come to cause them to tremble and to throw down the horns of the nations who have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. So the angel identifies the horns, but Yahweh himself explains his plan for them emphasizing his own personal response to each horn. It involves all of these craftsmen. Now a craftsman, what the craftsman would do is he would take the raw material and then he would either apply heat or force to that material so that he could shape it according to his own design. And that is exactly what God is doing with these four nations. The role of the craftsman is going to be to break down these nations according to God's design. So he provides the details of how he will do that. The craftsmen will have come to cause them to tremble. You see that in the verse there in verse 21. Cause them to tremble and they will throw down the nations who have scattered Judah. This is a total dismantling of these nations so that nothing is left. This is a total defeat. So four particular nations are in view. This is not a reference to Armageddon because there at that place, Messiah establishes his rule and reign and defeats all of the nations. Rather, this is a specific plan by which God will use four separate servants to avenge himself on these four nations who have abused his people. So the summary here is that God remembers the offenses against his people and he's made a plan to avenge himself against those nations. The application for us is that we can trust God in all things. When we consider where we are today, it's an election year. You consider whatever is happening in the events in this world. They provide uncertainty. They provide some level of anxiety of what is taking place. Uh, the truth from God's message is that Messiah Jesus is ready and he is poised to take his kingdom and that God will avenge himself against those who have mistreated his people. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the goodness of your word. Lord, I praise you that there is nothing that is a surprise to you. I praise you, Lord, that there is nothing within you that is uncertain about your plan for the future. I praise you, Lord, that you are not only a covenant-making God, but you are a covenant-keeping God. I praise you, Lord, for your wisdom to not only include the, the Jew, but the Gentile in your eternal plan. Lord, all of which centers around your son that you gave to us as a savior. That very same savior is the Messiah who's coming again. God, I pray that you would grant us your grace in living a life that is pleasing to you in light of your promises to us. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.